Kurt Lothlund, who was an astronomer, he, and we went to the field uh, and to measure everything, but uh, everything was worthwhile. But after a while, uh, I got a bit fed up with this uh, uh, topic because it was always about the megalithic monuments. So we measured everything which uh, there was big stones and so on and so on. But in the Carpathian Basin, where I live, uh, there are no megalithic monuments, and even unfortunately, there are no uh, rock carvings or rock paintings either. So uh, I didn't want to accept that, that people during the prehistory were not interested in the sky. So I started to study the archaeological material, uh, whether I can find something which might have some common with the astronomical uh, lore or the sky lore. Uh, unfortunately, there was no other archaeologist who, before me who has uh, ever uh, studied the, the uh, artifacts from this point of view. So that's, that means that it took quite a long time to develop my method uh, and how to get uh, a result uh, from the material which I can uh, work with. Uh, I don't say that this method is the best, best one, but I still try to find how to study the, uh, study the material and uh, still uh, I think I, can, I could have uh, some interesting result. Uh, as for the, uh, the archaeological, archaeologists uh, call a certain type of group uh, archaeological culture, which uh, doesn't uh, have anything to do with the, with the language or with the nationality. So we call a certain group as archaeological culture when this group uh, share uh, common elements in the technology, in the burial custom, in the settlement structure, and so on and so on. So when, we, when an archaeologist talk about culture, it means that this special group uh, we use because, of course, we don't know the name and either the language of these people who were living during the prehistory in the Carpathian Basin because these were non-literate societies. As I have a tendency to run out of the time, so I decided to give you first the, uh, the conclusions uh, just to be sure that I reached the end of the presentation. And what I am talking about, and I argue it is really the, the Neolithic and the Bronze Age of the Carpathian Basin, although I think most of the arguments uh, valid for the whole prehistoric Europe. Prehistoric, this period which I work with is from the 7th millennium to 900 BC, so it's quite a long period uh, for uh, prehistoric Europe. What can be deduced, deducted uh, from the material, uh, the, uh, from the material culture? Uh, that's the most in, one of the most important things. That the orientation does not mean an ed evident uh, interest in the sky. It means that if I, if I measure the orientation of the buildings, of the structures, of the uh, archaeological features which I can see in the in the soil, it doesn't mean if they show a common orientation, it doesn't mean evidently that it must be an astronomical orientation. So this must keep in our mind. The second one, that uh, as uh, we have several cultures during the Neolithic and the Bronze Age, uh, and I could st study them, and the material uh, suggests that not all archaeological cultures were so deeply interested in the, in the sky that might have been not so much interested. So one culture showed quite uh, interest. I can uh, find uh, several traces, and the other uh, seemingly doesn't show anything, which was I can see it in the material. Certainly, it doesn't mean that uh, it is not an absolutely solid evidence that they were not interested in the sky, but this is what I can find in the material, I mean the material culture. The third one, which I have found after several years investigation or study, that there is no difference about the astronomical knowledge between the so-called megalithic astronomy and which I can call non-megalithic astronomy, which I can uh, I could deduct it from the investigation of the non-megalithic uh, monument. I will show some uh, uh, example for it. So my uh, uh, my my main argument that for this period, I mean the Neolithic and the Bronze Age, the uh, prehistoric astronomy of Europe, the, the astronomy of prehistoric Europe 
was not so high level. I think it was just like uh, ethno-astronomic or uh, folk astronomy, so which contains not only the astronomical uh, phenomena, but also the, the atmospherical phenomena as well. Um, as an archaeologist, however, I am very much interested in the life of the, those uh, past people. So that's why we, uh, I wanted to get more, and I found more that although they might have very simple astronomical, scientific knowledge, practical knowledge about the sky, but the impact of the sky of that culture was ex sometimes it was extremely important and very significant. I will, I will also show some uh, cases for that. There is just, I don't want to talk about the megalithic astronomy, just there is one uh, thing which I would like to draw attention, that uh, the megalithic monuments were used for a long time. Quite often they were, they were re, uh, reconstructed and uh, there were additional uh, stones uh, added to the main monuments, so only the archaeological excavation can give can reveal uh, objective information about a megalithic monument, not only the date, but the whole structure. And I like to use this picture because you can see that the red spots are much, have, uh, have a different uh, uh, date than the other, the whole monument as well. So it means that there were some additional things later and they rearranged the structure. So what we measure, we should know which period the structure belonged to what we measure. So that's one of the main arguments that we, you have to be very careful with uh, measuring the stone monuments, as you can see now. Oh, doesn't want to move. And then, uh, of course, the, uh, one of the most popular or most uh, well-known method that measure the orientation. Now, in the Carpathian Basin, where there are no uh, megalithic monuments, uh, still we have found something interesting from the Neolithic age. Now I, you can see where the Carpathian Basin is, it's uh, about East or Central Europe, and I'm talking about uh, that, I'm showing example from that uh, 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 territory. Uh, one of the most interesting things that there are rondels from the uh, from the late Neolithic uh, period, about uh, six or 7,000 years, before Christ, and these uh, rondas have a, these are circular earthen work, and they have uh, interesting uh, so-called gates and access to the uh, inner side of the rondas, and uh, many uh, people have investigated these rondas, the orientation of these possibly so-called gates, and found many uh, uh, targets for this uh, possibly orientation, which has some uh, common with the uh, usual summer solstice or winter solstice, rising or setting uh, sun direction, and some calendrical construction were, might have been also proved that so-called mid-quarter days, uh, and maybe the roots of the ancient calendar, and so on and so on. We have measured with my colleague uh, more than 57 rondas, and we found the, that might have been the only reason they uh, orientated the this can get toward the rising sun. This was like a, a foundation rise, so, a right? So when they wanted to build these uh, rounders, it might have been the only purpose that the first uh, gate should face the actual sunrise. This uh, culture which these uh, rounders belong to, they also saw sh some interesting features in connection with the stars or the sky, because we, have, we can find them in the material also, in the artifacts, which like similar, like a, a sun symbols, or maybe uh, uh, some other more recognizable symbols of the sun. So this is uh, a 7,000 years old uh, material. If we step into the Bronze Age, uh, which is about uh, 2,800 uh, between the 900, we see uh, in the Carpathian Basin, the second uh, things which can be used uh, to measure the orientation is the houses. So uh, I have uh, studied uh, all Bronze Age culture in the Carpathian Basin and tried to measure, try to measure, try to investigate the orientation of their houses and then summarize the result. 
and I can I could found that uh, most of the uh, most of the orientation is still north and uh, south uh, orientation, which means that the the main axis of the houses was north and south. North and south is not the practical one because uh, of the sun. Generally, believe that when they somebody orientates or beats the house, they want uh, as much natural light into the house and some heat in the winter time. So north and south is not the best one, uh, the best direction. So that's why I believe that it might have been some common with the belief system that they used uh, north and south or north, south and north. The second one, which was the possibility to uh, study the uh, orientation, that's the orientation of the cemeteries, the orientation of the graves. It uh, also showed a very chaotic result because as almost as many cemeteries, uh, uh, as many uh, orientation target was. I even found uh, uh, I even found such big cemeteries, several hundred graves. Uh, more than 700 graves you can see on the under the chart, that uh, uh, certain graves uh, show the certain directions. Uh, they preferred, uh, for example, in these big cemeteries, there were 50 graves which preferred uh, explicitly the uh, uh, west, and, uh, uh, west and east and west uh, direction for Gloria custom, uh, although the others doesn't show, don't show any significant orientation. So it comes out that certainly depends on the burial uh, right if they want to orientate it or not, and which uh, was the, the uh, target for this orientation. Uh, and uh, of course we have studied several, many other uh, case studies, but we could uh, uh, conclude at the, uh, from the result that actually there is no significant dif difference between the megalithic, so-called megalithic astronomy and between the non-megalithic astronomy uh, during the Neolithic and the Bronze Age time. You need, uh, for the megalithic astronomy, you can see the possibly alignments with the summer or winter sources. For the non-megalithic one, we also found these possible targets. Possibly alignments with certain moon positions, Easter full moon turning point, something, something like this. We can, we can also found it uh, for the non-megalithic uh, features. And even for the non-megalithic uh, uh, case, there were uh, uh, colleagues who tried to prove that they might have used uh, a certain measuring unit for, uh, for uh, building this big earthwork because uh, they believe that the, the size of the earth, earth were, were not uh, very intentional. They wanted to do it in the same way. So actually, that's what I would like to add, emphasize that there was no, I don't think that there is a big difference between any part of Europe during the prehistory for the sky lore. So it did, it's better to, to study a certain culture and not the whole and to not the whole uh, Europe territories and to push everything into the into one basket. And even for the megalithic uh, uh, astronomy, these uh, cultures who use megalithic monuments are quite different, even in time and even in territory and culture as well. So the megalithic astronomy is not one culture. It's it, uh, different uh, prehistoric cultures build uh, big stone monuments. And what is more interesting for an archaeologist, what is more, what is beyond the orientation? I mean, what is the impact which uh, this, the sky lower, uh, the sky might have influenced, how the sky in, uh, might have influenced the, uh, the societies during the, during the Neolithic and the Bronze Age. And one, uh, we have a beautiful, really beautiful find, which uh, we know exactly that it comes from the Bronze Age, and we, we, even the archaeologists accept that this might be a sky map, as or sky, yes, this might be a sky plate, uh, as we call them, the, so, uh, it, which was uh, discovered in uh, Germany. But the gold comes from the Carpathian Basin because it was, it was in, uh, the gold was mined in the Carpathian Basin and transported into the place where the disc was made, at least the uh, 
material testing prove this. So we have something common with this beautiful plate. And the uh, archaeologists accept that this plate uh, has something common with the sky, so it might represent the sky. We have been there with my, uh, 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 with my astronomer colleague, we have investigated this, and uh, uh, our argument was that uh, this uh, disk um, not only this depict uh, the star and uh, the sun and the moon, possible, but it might depict some atmospheric phenomena as well. And that the, the upper one it might depict the rainbow, and uh, this uh, golden uh, arc on the left, the, the longer golden arc on the edge, and uh, the, the, the second in opposite is uh, missing, it might have depicted the rising and setting sun, the, not the sun, but the, the horizon, uh, when it is red or when it is a bit uh, purple light. And there is only one uh, group of stars which we accept that uh, Schlosser, the German uh, astronomer, uh, argued that it might have been the Pleiades, so we can accept it uh, f from the analogies. We have written this paper, if, if somebody is interested in the details, uh, you can read it and you can uh, get, uh, get it from me. So what I wanted to, what we wanted to argue that this disk depict not a real, uh, uh, sky, I mean not uh, a real moment of the sky because uh, uh, when you look at them you can see the sun, you cannot see the stars. You can see the moon and the sun at the same time, but not the, the stars. So it means that this, uh, this plate is, can be taken like, can be taken similar to the shaman drum when they depict what they want it to be important for them. So they wanted to express what, what entities, what celestial entities are the most important for the group who created this. this. And the Pleiades and the sun, or maybe the full moon, and the and the, uh, 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 question, and the, and the rainbow, and the rising and setting uh, uh, part of the horizon must have been the uh, most important for them. So that's why they picked them in, in that way. And at the same time, this, uh, this disc uh, draw attention that uh, uh, during this period, the, the people's worldview might have been similar to a shamanistic worldview. And uh, the investigation of archaeological finds and having uh, good analogies from the indigenous culture, indigenous knowledge, we know that there are other archaeological material which also represent the sky or the celestial phenomena or the people's uh, relation to the sky, although you cannot see, cannot recognize them at once because they are not sun symbols, they are not moon symbols, but they are other symbols which we know from the uh, study and from the archaeological knowledge that they represent also the sky. So it, the impact can be proved by other materials which are not sun symbols or something like this. And now we, I show some interesting and unique uh, artifacts which come from graves and we call them uh, wizard graves or magic uh, graves. Some uh, set uh, shows certain similarities with the celestial object, maybe stars or suns or something like it. And some others doesn't show so clearly that it might have been some common in the sky. But it also uh, gives the information so the impact can be cultural, social, spiritual, maybe artistic. So there are many, many possibilities uh, how to continue the investigation. And we know that, for example, in the Carpathian Basin, from the middle of the Bronze Age, about 1,600, one, one uh, the use of the uh, sky symbols or star symbols or solar symbols uh, almost jumped, so there are many, many, many uh, artifacts decorated with uh, solar symbol. What might have been the reason? This can be the, this can be the uh, topic of the uh, investigation also. And from this period, we know that even the armors, the weapons, the, the, the shields and others were 
uh, use, uh, were decorated with solar symbols or star symbols or something like this, this something like that which might have connection to the sky as well. And uh, there is uh, one or two culture, unfortunately not more, which we are convinced that they were very fascinated by the stellar sky because they have beautiful uh, artifacts uh, which uh, seems to be decorated just uh, just um, uh, uh, star-like or solar-like uh, motifs. I am working with this material now, so it, so I cannot say you the I cannot show you the result for this. Uh, work or study, but I can show you how interesting uh, it can be. Because uh, this, uh, uh, this culture, which, is, uh, uh, which, uh, which like to use so many uh, solar symbols or star symbols, have a very special uh, symbol which they like to use many, many, uh, many, many ports or many, many vessels. That's the so-called number five symbol, which uh, arrangement is very typical because it is arranged like on a uh, on a dice, dice on a dice, a playing dice. I don't know if I, yeah on a dice. So you can see that this uh, culture use it anyhow, and even when they use it like a stand. So even they arrange this, they use this arrangement in a in a very uh, interesting way. The archaeologist who worked with this material first believed that this uh, five, number five symbol is uh, the depiction of the Orion. Unfortunately, I, uh, I don't believe that it is that one, but still he must be right that he ha it must have some common with the, uh, with the stars. Uh, what can an archaeologist do when uh, find something which he would like to study we have to find analogies. We have to look for analogies. First of all, in the same period, in the same archaeological period. So first, we must we try to find contemporary um, uh, examples or analogies. And we have found that uh, in the con almost contemporary uh, material from the Mesopotamian material, from the who uh, called Ur uh, tombs or royal tombs, we found interesting analogies the so-called playing board game boards, which are depicted uh, uh, with the same symbols. So this uh, five symbol can be found on them. And we know that these, uh, these uh, games were used uh, for divine, uh, these games were used for uh, fortune telling, but not fortune telling for a private person, but fortune telling for the, for the whole society. So they used it for divination. In, in the beginning of the year. So this, uh, be, this uh, shows that this number five symbol might have been some, something similar, some similar role. And what it is interesting that this uh, kind of symbol can be found, this kind of symbol can be found many, many other vessels. These uh, analogies come from a later Bronze Age and uh, it shows that this vessel can be found in many archaeological culture and it was used for several hundred years. So my colleagues believe that this uh, special unique vessel with this uh, five mouths uh, was used in some, some ceremonial circle, uh, some ceremonial uh, role. The purpose was used for some sacrifice or rite. And even we found in the earlier archaeological culture, so I don't know what this uh, five uh, depict, but I know that it must have been uh, extremely important for them because they use it very uh, um, decisive way and they use it on, uh, on uh, a prestige artifact, uh, on golden uh, armlet, on uh, such uh, pots we were, which were also used just in in um, put as a cultic object, so objects are not in the home in, among the common uh, pots and the vessels for cooking something and so on. So when they use the same symbol for long, long period, the same one, the same arrangement, uh, we are convinced that uh, it must have meant something. So it was a real symbolical meaning. And what is interesting that this, uh, 
uh, number five symbol meant quite a lot for the old Chinese. Uh, all the way in later period, it's quite so much that even these so-called five elements meant uh, like a rule for everything. So there were five most important elements, there were five most important color, and even the uh, society was structured like this. I found in the National Museum of uh, Peking that uh, from the Shang Dynasty, they also know this symbol, and these three uh, vessels uh, had a, a, a ritual purpose, they used for ritual purpose, so it participated in some uh, ceremony. But um, it might have been that it doesn't mean more than, than uh, so it was not, the meaning was, was not uh, so complicated like uh, uh, for the ancient, Chi ancient Chinese, but it might have been just a simpler one that I was told when I wanted to buy this uh, type of Berber cross in Morocco two years ago because the person who, 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 who was selling it told me the story of this uh, five, uh, symbol five and the story was that this symbol uh, depicted uh, the uh, most important five, the five most important stars which help you to, which help you to find your way in the desert. The, pe the person, a nice old person, uh, told me that his uh, grandfather was a leader of a, a caravan leader, so his job was to find a way uh, crossing the desert, and he wanted him to be also a caravan leader, so he told him that, my son, you should remember that these five important stars help you to find your way in the desert, which it means that he didn't, he didn't remember which star they were, but actually this means that it is not a constellation, it is just five important something from the sky which help you to do something, even in a, in a ritual activity or maybe in a practical way to find your way in the, uh, in the desert or in the steppe somehow. But uh, if, what is the, what I have, arguments I can reach or conclusion, this will be the next topic of the next conference. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Amelia.